All right, ladies and gentlemen, we could not leave Extreme Couture. We could not skip this visit with Eric Nixick without getting some of his fight wisdom. So we're about to do that now. Welcome to the Morning Combat UFC 294 pregame preview. Now, we're all sober. BC's on drugs. That's okay. We're here to have a good time. He's partying. In any event, we're going to talk about some of the bigger fights from the UFC 294 card, which is going to be a and bit of a banger. Eric disclaimer, Nixick. Eric, I don't know if you're new to pregame preview, but we expect real talk. All right. Like men do. <laughs> the guardians of masculinity, everybody. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Drink that one in. All right. Hey, everybody. Luke Thomas here. Uh, you may not have heard, but if not, let me help you out here. So uh, me and Brian Campbell and the whole MK crew, we went to Extreme Couture in Las Vegas. We sat down with Eric Nixick. By the way, we got a fantastic room service diaries with him. You can check that out, youtube.com slash morning combat. But we also recorded a UFC 294 pregame preview. Here's the problem. As you may have heard, um, all of the fights that we talked about when we, when we recorded that video no longer exist, right? So it's supposed to be Ikram Alaskarov taking on Nasruddin Imavov. That's done. And now it's Varley Alves versus Alaskarov. We didn't discuss that. Then, of course, in your main event, it was originally supposed to be uh, Islam Makachev taking on Charles Oliveira, the rematch. That's done. Now it's Volkanovsky. It's a fine fight, but it's just not the one we discussed. Not much, anyway. And then in your co-main event, we thought, okay, surely the Hamzat and Polo Costa fight will survive. And then, of course, it did not. He is now taking on Kamar Usman. These are all fine fights. We're not complaining about the fights. I'm just trying to tell you these are not the fights that we discussed when we went to Las Vegas to talk with Eric Nixick. But we didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In fact, there were some pieces of wisdom along the way that we were able to pick up. So let me set this up. We've got a few things we're going to show you here. First of all, we talked to Eric Nixick about how he scored the first Islam and Volk fight. He'll give us that. Plus some details around how Islam might compare to Habib. So let's take a look at that. Very quickly, how did you score Islam versus Volk? I had Volk. I had mm. Volk. Yeah, I had Volk three to two. Okay. In your mind, how does Islam compare to Habib? Good or bad? You know, it's interesting because of the stances. Uh, you know, one's, one's orthodox, one's southpaw. I feel like Islam does a very good job of utilizing his range. Um, and it, it's a different shot selection, I think, with more of like a head inside single, um, maybe to the body lock sequences that he does. Whereas like, you know, Khabib was more of a blast double style as well. So a little bit different make chain wrestling styles, if you will. But when it comes to their, their ideologies, the ground and pound, it's very much staple a bottom leg. They'll stay in the half guard position. I love the fact that they don't rush from position to position. They always stayed in the spot until that spot expired. They're working you, they're ground and pounding you, they're making you move. And then when you move, then they just go to another spot where they get back to the backside wrist ride or they kill a bottom leg or they turk a leg. Then they get back to their ground and pound again. So both of them have that in them. I'd say for me, it's, it's hard to compare, but you know, maybe with more of the striking elements that with the southpaw side of, of Islam is maybe the biggest difference I see. Well, we talked about comparing Habib to Islam and it's like they're different fighters and Islam's offense in, in the variety of it so far seems to be suggesting that. Do you think though, and we don't fully know until we get full evidence that he's wired the same way as Habib because what made Habib special were the intangibles beyond just the dominant wrestling. I mean, what he did against Gaethje to transition from perilous leg kicks to instant submission right. tap is just like, while numerous serious injuries that he's fielding, are you seeing some of that in Islam? Like this iron will and focus cannot be dissuaded? I see that quite a bit. And, you know, it's funny because this is a guy who's been really on our radar for a long time because of Ali. Ali's talked about Islam for over 10 some odd years that I remember, like, hearing about him here, about him here. Ali Abdelaziz. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and so, you know, over time, I think, again, like, it's like, it's like that big brother, right, who's, who's kind of shepherded him along, this, this young man along. And now you want to see him surpass you. You want to see him better than you, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's all hands on deck when it comes to Islam, especially with his team and his camp. And I, I think you can see that out of him. Has he trained here? I know he's an AKA guy, but has he been through here? Yeah, at all? Islam's been here quite a bit. So it's funny when he comes into town, we, we, we give him like our, our exercise equipment, our bikes, and this, this, and that, and uh, so he can cut weight and do do his works. But he'll he'll, he'll come in here with uh, with the guys and Khabib, and you know they'll come train. All right, so that's the main event and some of the components there. But what about that co-main event? Hamzat Shemaev taking on Kamara Usman again was supposed to be Paulo Costa. That's now gone. We didn't want to throw, again, the baby out with the bathwater. We actually do have, I think, some interesting things that Eric Nixick had to say. You'll recall Hamzat Shemaev has spent time training at Extreme Couture, training against some of his guys. He tells us what he saw during that time. 
and also the kinds of things that make Hamzat Shemaev such a strong, good, talented, potentially future champion. Let's see. I think what he's fought twice now at 185, and that was one was was uh, Kevin Holland because of a default. Which yes? was weird. Well, that may have been 180. And he had a yes. mere shot right. before yes. that. Yes. And a mere shot before that, right. right? So we really haven't seen. Well, oh, I could take that back because he fought John Phillips at 185. Yes, but again, yes, yes. If, that's we, true. if we count that, yeah, if we, we count John Phillips, right? Um, so this this will be to me his his very ultimate test when it, moving up a, a weight class against a guy who, you know, is a you know, staple at that 185 pound division in, in Paulo Costa. So very, very interesting to see, who, you know, what what guy, what approach they come with in this fight. Oh, what can you tell us about, you've seen him do rounds in here? Kamzat. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's, I mean, we saw the Mearshart fight, but just to put this to bed, no issues with his power translating at 185? No, okay. none. None. What I, I was blown away at by Kamzat was his blend between his striking and his wrestling. When I held pads for him, now, you know, we always say it's the space between the notes that makes the music, right? And it's that little bit of that like level, faint, where my, where my product placement goes, my high lows. And he's collecting data. He's trying to see when I faint level change, is he looking to underhook? Is he looking to down block? Is he looking to frame? Is his lead hand come down where I have a clear path from my right hand? Is, what is he doing? What data am I collecting? And Hamzad is doing that in between every beat of his striking game. Mm. So when he's throwing a combination or before that combination sets up, it has a little level feint of this, a maybe touch or a grab or a hand feint or a pump. And me as even the pad holder, knowing what the combination is, I'm like, oh <laughs> shit, what's, you know, so that was the thing that jumped off the page to me immediately when I, you know, it's almost like test driving a Ferrari, right? I knew the, I knew the guy could crack. I knew what he's capable of, but man, the way he blended everything together, that's what I was blown away from. You know what also seems to be pretty good, if I may? His, the quickness of his level change. In. Like lightning, yeah. right? Yeah. And he covers distance too, perhaps inadvisably, but he can do it. He covers distance very, very well, and you're absolutely right. When he decides to go, it's sudden, right? It's yes. like, yeah, right. it's sudden. Exactly. It's like yeah. an inside linebacker filling a gap. He's going. It's not, there's not going to do, you know. And, and the other thing that I really love about Kamzat's style is he doesn't employ two part takedowns. And what do I mean by that? He has a penetration step when he gets entered, he doesn't stop his feet, right? Where a lot of times you'll see guys and they'll get in on the fit in and they'll get in on a nice and double. And they hold the position. And they hold the position. Yeah. Well, what happens to the defensive guy? He starts to hunker down, he yeah. starts to get his weight, starts to get his underhooks. Yeah. Whereas when Kamzat goes in, there's a, there's, a, there's a carom that Randy always talked about off the cage. There's a bounce. So when you get that carom, it's the yank right off of it. Mm -hmm. So there's no two-part takedown when it comes to comms out. It's blast, go, and tear through that thing. Now, of course, you might be asking, well, if Hamzat wins, that means he's going to fight Sean Strickland. Well, in fact, we did talk about that with Eric Nixick. He has some thoughts about it. He, this is something he has imagined was going to happen. It looks like it very well could. We shall see what happens at UFC 294. But here's what he had to say about that possibility. But he has the type of buzz surrounding him as a next potential champion and, and really just dominant villain. Like, right. like we're, we're looking at the potential of Habib handing the baton to Islam in the same coaching tree. Right. But the real baton handoff might be Islam to Chemaev as like the right. next foreign villain that's taken over American MMA in that way. So I feel like he's motivated to come out here and make a statement. I don't know if that leads to more striking or just inevitably going right back to the wrestling, but um, you have a dog in this fight. I do. You are the trainer of Sean Strickland, the middleweight champion. Uh, you guys know what could happen to Hamzat Shock, Stock if he goes out there and finishes Costa and Absolutely. does it that disastrously and dramatically. Is there, a, is there a window here, a possibility where it could be Strickland versus Chemaev next in your eyes? I think that is the fight. That's, mm. that's next, in my opinion. I mm. think I think if, if Hamzat wins the way that I think he can win, I think that is the fight you have to make, in my opinion, just because of the ceiling that you're talking about. And, you know, the, the kind of the unknown about, about Hamzat and, you know, the, the potential of star sure. power and all these things that are kind of lining up. I, I, I feel like, as a promotion, I think you can make the DDP and Izzy fight because I think that has a big draw. Non-title, you're saying? Non-title, but I think that the... the, the or interim. Or in them, but I feel like Hamzat and Sean has a nice backstory to it. You know, training partners, guys that we, we respect. These guys, you know, it's business the way it is. But at the end of the day, 
we also have a target on our back now. Did they get a lot of time together? They did, a lot of time, yeah. What is the history? I thought that they felt, my, my recollection was they both felt like they got a lot out of it, right? 100%, yeah. I mean, Hamza, Darren Till, all those guys, they were out here for a couple months. Hamza probably was out here three separate times. Um, kind of felt like a teammate to me. And not, not only that, like, I really enjoyed having him in here as the competitor that he is. You know, I think he made the, the room much better. Yeah. Um, he was very no nonsense. I mean, you know, he, he drives like shit. The guy drives crazy. But <laughs> that sounds so out of character. Right. Yeah. But um, no, in the room and uh, uh, as a training partner, man, he was he was great to have in here, and I I, I, I truly enjoyed having him and his team in here. So, you know, uh, it's business. When it comes to that point, you know, we have to do our job. How much of uh, how much of what he does? I mean, is it just seems like. The intensity just has to be regulated Goldilocks style the right way. Right. And he hasn't quite figured it out because you don't want to take away his intensity. Mm. His intensity just overwhelms even good fighters. Yeah. But what you don't want to do is have him spend it on someone really good and right. then there's no way to bounce back. Right. right? And that and that's kind of the interesting Did you guys thing. see that in the training room as well? Cal um, calibrating intensity? Not not so much in here. I think I think he did a very good job of managing his energy in here, especially in his sparring rounds. Um, but I can see what you're talking about, especially in the Gilbert Burns right, fight. Right, the Gilbert fight, exactly. Right, yeah. and then and then you know what does that look like if you make it into a five round fight, and a guy right. gets out of the first two rounds, and maybe you're down 0-2, right? But but Gilbert was coming on in the third round. He won that Gilbert third was round. about on. that life, dude. Gil <laughs> Gilbert was Gil Gilbert. If that was a five round fight, I don't think it would have maybe got a different result. And that say? and that was kind of to tap into what we did against Abus when when Sean fought Abus. We were willing to throw round one away because we knew how much effect it was going to have on a guy like Abus. Yeah. For later on and, right. and really we thought sean would get him out of there in three or four we didn't know it was going to be round two yeah. but that same theory was like hey let's let's get not necessarily give a round away but let's make this guy work a lot more in this round where i think that's something that you know if i'm fighting comms on a five rounder might be something we try to look at and that's it that's what we got. So we didn't want to just completely chuck all this stuff and leave it on the cutting room floor. We want to give you guys a sense of some of the larger things and more interesting things that he had to say that were still relevant to the fights that we have. One more reminder, if you've not seen it, you can go and check out that Eric Nixick Room Service Diaries, youtube.com slash morning combat. Can't encourage it enough. One of the smartest guys in the business, hardest working guys in the business, one of the best guys in the business, and a phenomenal coach just the same. All right. Enjoy the fights at UFC 294. Thank you guys so much for watching this. We'll catch you all next time.